Hi, I'm Paul Jay, and welcome to the analysis.news. And this is a segment I call Reality Asserts Itself. That's where the focus is more on why our guest thinks what they think and how their worldview was formed. And we'll be back in a few seconds with Matt Taibbi. Bernie Sanders said that Matt Taibbi is one of the few journalists in America who speaks truth to power. Matt's the author of four New York Times bestsellers and an award-winning columnist for Rolling Stone, and his reporting and commentary on TK News is amongst the top five for numbers of subscribers on Substack. Sometimes I think it's at the top. His podcast, Useful Idiots, co-hosted by Katie Halper, is widely popular. His YouTube videos often do hundreds of thousands of views. So what is Matt's backstory and what shaped the thinking of this former left fielder for the Uzbek national baseball team. Now joining us is Matt Taibbi. Hi, Paul. What the, what the hell? Left fielder for the Uzbek? <laughs> okay, we're gonna, we'll get to that. We'll get to <laughs> okay. that. But, but you are without, actually, you're the, at least for reality asserts itself, you are the first professional athlete. <laughs> that's pretty funny that's yeah, too in the bad <laughs> yeah and in, in the past no i used to do sports in the past i used to interview all kinds of athletes it was a great challenge actually to get past the ridiculous Cliches. well the media training they've had they've mm -hmm. all been taught how to say nothing and uh, yeah yeah one day at a time just gotta you know go out there and do the best you can and hopefully things will work out i get more aggressive <laughs> get more aggressive that's right. Yeah, you got to be, and, gonna be and, more and, aggressive. And, yeah, get more aggressive. What, and what's your strategy? Oh, I'm I'm going to get more aggressive. Uh, <laughs> the the only ones that don't do that are those guys on the basketball show, Shaq and uh, right, yeah, uh, Charles Shaq, Barkley. Shaq, Shaq and Barkley are a little different. Yeah, but yeah, mostly they, it's they just actually, you know, just trying to help my team out any way I can, you know, and uh, we'll do the best that we can, and hopefully things yeah. work out. All right. So like I said, this is a more biographical, although in the course of things, we'll, we'll get into some of the contemporary stuff. Um, but, but to begin with, uh, your story is rather unique. Uh, and, and right from the beginning, your lineage is kind of unique. Uh, so, so you're born in Boston. Talk about a little bit about you know, you've, your parents and so on. So, um, yeah, I, I was actually born in New Jersey and then I, mo I moved to Boston when I was, when I was little, my parents were, um, my father was a student at Rutgers, uh, and my parents were 20 years old when I was born. He was a, um, he was a reporter also while he was a student for the home news in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, and he started when he was 18 years old. So my, uh, my father was in the news business, um, even a couple of years before I was born. Uh, and so I grew up around, uh, that the industry he's, uh, adopted. Uh, he was born in Hawaii. Uh, he's of Filipino and Hawaiian descent. Uh, grew up in an Italian family with a, that has a Sicilian name of Arabic descent. So that's why my, I have a, the name Taibi. Uh, my mother's Irish, so uh, it's it's very odd the the uh, the ethnic portion of it. Well, did you grow up thinking of yourself as what uh, in terms of ethnic identity, uh, Italian or Filipino, uh, uh, Hawaiian? Uh, what, what what was your sense of the, of of that? Well, I'm obviously not very dark skinned, so my father is, uh, but. Um, no, I just thought of myself, I guess, as white. I didn't really think about it. Uh, it it's funny, uh, you know, obviously more recently it's become a thing that everybody's very conscious of, but I, I just really wasn't when I, when I was growing up, not so much. Um, you know, my father was not, uh, not until later in life did he really get interested in looking into his own family background or looking for his real parents or anything like that. So it just wasn't a topic that came up a whole lot in, in our household. And he was a journalist, but what was the political culture? So, uh, my, uh, you know, I think my mother was probably when I was younger, more political than I, than my father was, um, you know, they were, they were very both progressive left leaning. They marched against the war in Vietnam and all that. But, uh, my father in his career, he's proud of the fact that he only wrote, I think two editorials, his whole career. He was very much a straight news reporter, his whole um, his whole journalistic career really didn't get into his opinions on the air very much, uh, or in print. 
Um, but, uh, you know, later in life, I think that he, he became sort of more overtly, I guess, pro-democratic, but uh, that was privately, not publicly. Mm. And, and what, what years are you a teenager? Uh, in the 80s. Uh, yeah. So during, so during Reagan, during the Reagan years, those were, those were good years to be a teenager. I have to say really great teen movies. Um, yeah, there were, there was a lot, there were a lot of ups, uh, lot, lots of upside there to, for being young in those era. And, and do you have any, uh, like, are you at all political or are you mostly watching teen movies? Like, are you getting what Reagan's doing in terms of domestic and foreign policy? So I, I was actually kind of political growing up. Um, when I, I was a freshman at um, NYU, uh, when I was 18, I actually uh, ran the NYU for Jesse Jackson campaign in 1988. Oh, really? Yeah, I was I was actually quite, you know, sort of into liberal politics when I was younger. My, again, my mother was kind of very politically committed. She volunteered for campaigns when, um, when I was growing up. And uh, I, I didn't really think about politics in like a sophisticated way, probably until I was... In my teen years, I remember I read, um, you know, I was I was kind of a nerd. I, I read a lot of books growing up and uh, I started getting into politics a little bit more, uh, the sort of contemporary political stuff when I was in my late teens. Like I remember reading Chomsky, for instance. Oh, yeah. That's what I was going to ask you. What books kind of stand out as help uh, f- helping to form the way you thought about things? So yeah, I, I I remember I remember reading uh, Soul on Ice, the autobiography uh, autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, uh, I read, um, you know, again, uh, political economy in the, in the United States, manufacturing consent. Um, those were some of the, but I was I was much more into the thing is I was uh, sort of a literature nerd when I was growing up, so I I had a conscious kind of policy of not reading um, too much nonfiction and not, and mostly reading older fiction. That's, it was kind of a nerdy thing. I was really into like 19th century novels when I was, um, when I was like a, a teenager. Uh, how'd, you, but, how'd you get that? Is that uh, like an English teacher or something? No, I mean, I, again, I, I was an only child. Um, I was a real nerd. Uh, I moved a lot when I was a kid. So it was one of those things where books, were sort of my companions growing up and some somewhere in my early teen years. Yeah, I think actually a, a, one of my high school teachers, like pretty early on, I, um, turned me on to Gogol, who, you know, is a Russian writer. Um, and I is was that, very... That is, is he the guy that did The Nose? The Nose, yeah, and Dead yeah, Souls. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and I was really... Uh, my ambition from being very young was I wanted to be a comic novelist. And so I was, I was very, very focused on um, all the sort of great, funny writers from, you know, the, the 19th and early 20th century. And that's what I really wanted to do. Uh, I never wanted to be a reporter like that. that, that I admired my father and I, I, I was around media my whole life, but that was not something I wanted to be. I wanted to be um, a fiction writer. And then it turned out that I, you know, I wasn't good at it. So uh, <laughs> I, I sort of fell back in the family business. Well, did, did the is it the literature that leads you to Russia? Yes. So I was I was really obsessed with Russian books, and I wanted um, Gogol was my hero. I desperately wanted to read Gogol in Russian. Uh, so I I studied in Leningrad at the time uh, because that was where he was from. Uh, so I went I went to study there. And, okay, what uh, what year is that? Nineteen ninety, nineteen eighty nine, ninety. Oh wow! This is quite a transformative year. Yeah, it was as as it happened. It was uh, it was it was amazing because I was there. Right, at, I studied in um, at uh, the Leningrad Polytechnical University. Actually, it, at the time, it was the Polytechnic Institute, uh, and uh, it was at the very tail end of the Soviet Union. So I had Soviet teachers, and I went to a Soviet school, and all that stuff. Um, and then, and then, obviously, the the revolution took place uh, the, the next year. Why weren't you then more imbued with the Cold War, anti-communism, anti-Soviet Union? Uh, even if your family's democratic, the majority of the Democratic Party is rooted, you know, in Trumanism and Kennedy's anti, you know, Cold War stuff. Uh, what, what, why were you not? It wasn't like I was uh, sort of pro-communist. I just didn't. Um... I had a real appreciation for 
sort of the Russian mindset, the Russian people, their sense of humor, their culture, something about it I found really attractive from a, um, a very young age. Obviously, they're in their literature. The Russians have a tremendous storytelling tradition, tr tremendous literary tradition, and especially with humor, they, they you know that their their writers are incredibly gifted in that area. So I I felt like I had a connection there, and the the politics I, I it wasn't something that I really thought about so much when I was younger. Um, and then when I got to the Soviet Union, obviously there were things that were incredibly repugnant about that system, and and they were they were immediately apparent, but. The country itself, um, I was kind of a depressed kid. So when I landed in, in Leningrad, I was like, wow, I fit in here. Everybody's miserable. Uh, and <laughs> it, uh, it was it was perfect, actually. So so does that mean you also join in the vodka tradition? Absolutely. Yeah. No, there's no way. And in, in, in Russia, they say, uh, which means everything is done through the bottle. Uh, and you can't really do anything. In fact, that ended up being the reason I kind of left Russia um, many years later is because I just got exhausted. Like there's, there's really no way to do journalism there without drinking very heavily. And it got to be it got to be a thing where I just couldn't really do it anymore. You know, you would go to a, a provincial city and you would meet somebody, say, who was like the director of a factory and you really just wanted to do a 30 minute interview, but it would be two days later and you'd wake up in another city or something. And yeah, it, it just got, it got to be too much. No, I, I had, I made a documentary film in Albania before the transition Okay, mm -hmm. and you go, you couldn't go anywhere without drinking Raki and the same. Thing. Right. And yep, so, you, that's know, you, right. go, you go to a collective farm, you sit down with the secretary and chairman of the farm. And if you don't drink Raki for four hours, you, you don't get your interview. Yeah. Did they do that there, too? This is the, the communist thing. The, I guess it comes from a, from a Russian thing, so you probably wouldn't do it in other countries. But they used, they used to have a tattoo on your neck for alcoholics. So oh, that's, no. the, that's the sort of symbol for drinking is, is that. But, oh, really? Oh, Jesus. Mm. No, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't think so. I, I didn't see one. But I did have to go through a hell of a lot of Rocky. Uh, yeah, um, I'll bet. I'll bet. Yeah. Uh, so so you, you go there not to be a journalist. You go there mm. because you're interested in literature. And so it doesn't sound like it's all that long before you're a freelance journalist in Russia. It's pretty hard to grow up in the U.S. and not have a dose of it. Uh, what, what did that reality of Soviet life at that time, uh, how did that jive with your identity and view of the world? How did it, did it, did it change you? Um, I think, you know, always, even when I was a little kid, I, the one thing I think that probably attracted me to this job is that I... Um, I moved a lot when I was when I was really young, so I was really used to kind of settling in new places and kind of listening to what other people were saying and trying to fit in. Uh, after I graduated, I I didn't really have any saleable skills except that I spoke Russian and I I knew a little bit about journalism from watching my uh, my my parents, uh, my father, my stepmother. Uh, so I uh, I decided just to move back to where I'd gone to college and set up shop as a stringer. I went door to door in all the, uh, to all the bureaus in Moscow and Petersburg, um, offered my services as a stringer, didn't get a whole lot of work, uh, and moved to, uh, moved to Uzbekistan because there was less competition. Uh, and that's how I got started. So you grew up in the Reagan eighties. You grew up with this being the uh, evil empire. Uh, you know, the, the, the whole culture was imbued with that the Soviet Union is the existential enemy of freedom and so on and so on. Uh, you get there, what do you find? How does this jive with you know, what you thought the Soviet Union might be? So I, I guess I, I never really fell for any of the propaganda about Russians being these sort of unfeeling, robotic uh, automatons of the state. Um, I think I had done enough reading about the culture that I had this idea that they were probably just a lot like us uh, underneath, although of course with some important cultural differences, you know, they were, but they were clearly a very soulful people, very colorful, um, great sense of humor. And I, I had that sense before I even got there. And when I got there, I discovered that was very much the case. And I think that was very kind of formative for how I think about politics generally, that people are more or less the same everywhere. The politics may change. Um, 
but uh, but people basically there's the same distribution of good and bad and um, positive, negative, um, you know, grave and not uh, in the population everywhere. So I tried to be a good ambassador to of like American culture. I, th I took all the things that I thought were positive and funny about, about American life. I tried to appreciate their language and and um, and just connect with them on that level. So how do you get from this? To journalism, though, and, and I, we talked a little bit off camera about this. A part of doing journalism in the Soviet Union and Russia um, is is very much about vodka. And you talked about you, you had felt depressed, and the, the treatment for depression in in Soviet Union and Russia is vodka. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I wasn't, you know, I, I, like any red blooded American. I certainly drank enough in college, but. Um, it wasn't like a, a big problem for me, but, it, but in Russia, you know, in order to do journalism, I, and I think this is sort of um, just a rule of thumb just for the business generally anywhere, not just in Russia. I think establishing trust is, is kind of a, a central feature of how the business works. When you meet anybody in any situation, you have to demonstrate to people that you understand them, that you're willing to, to communicate with them uh, in a way that they're comfortable with, um, you know, sort of follow their customs. Um, and so in Russia, that very often just means sitting down and having a drink with somebody. I, I think one of the things that, that, um, that Russians did a lot, at least when I was there, is if you sat down with somebody, they don't like this kind of transactional way of getting along that the Americans have. Like, I want something, you want something, let's get down and let's, let's get it over with and, and get, uh, you know, move on from the meeting. Russians have a different way of looking at things. Like they want you to make a connection, be friends, you know, have something personal between you, and then you can get to the business after that. Uh, and you can't just be, it can't just be a pro forma thing either. Like you have, you have actually have to demonstrate um, that, that you, you want to get past that kind of uh, Rubicon first. I liked it at, at the start and I, and I think I understood it, uh, but it eventually became kind of exhausting uh, because, you know, I would, I would do an interview with somebody, uh, you know, a factory owner or something like that in some provincial town. And it was really, it would really just be 30 minutes of business that I would want to do, but then I would end up, you know, in another city two, two days later. So uh, <laughs> that got to be tiring after a while. Now you're there, you know, in the '90s, which is you know one of the most transformative. I'm, I guess, outside of the Russian Revolution, one of the most transformative periods of Russian history. Um, how did you find that people were responding to this? Well, the, you know, essentially the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yeah, and that was an unbelievable story. I, I was, I, I think, actually at the time, I probably underestimated how. Uh, bizarre and um, in incredible it was, like just in terms of a historical standpoint, that the unbelievable sweeping changes that were going on in society, like on an almost day-to-day -day basis, um, their whole worlds were overturned. I, I remember being there, for instance, when the ruble collapsed. Um, I think that was in 93 or 94. So people had been saving their whole lives. They'd been, they didn't trust banks in the Soviet area, so they, they would you know take uh, rubles and they would stick them under their mattresses and they did this for decades. And so everybody everywhere had these sort of personal bank accounts in their houses. And then overnight, it just all became worthless. And I remember going out in the street and seeing people just wandering around in a daze or screaming, you know, to nobody in particular. Um, I, when I was there in my student days, there was never any street violence of any kind, right? Or, or, or disturbance. And then almost overnight, it became, you know, like the Chicago in the 30s. Uh, there was this sort of carousing gangster culture that just blossomed, you know, within a matter of months, really. Uh, so I saw all kinds of crazy things. There were coups that I, you know, that I was there for. Um, and, you know, the Russians are an incredibly resilient people, obviously. They've been through a lot in their history. And I think, um, that probably steeled them for, for, for a lot of what happened in the nineties, but still, still it was really intense. And I think Americans don't understand, um, how, how, uh, how deeply they took to heart a, a lot of the negative things that happened during that decade. 
the uh, period of the 90s, as you say, Chicago gangster. I mean, at the highest levels, the, there was a straightforward looting of the uh, what had been the publicly owned Soviet economy. Uh, a lot of it apparatchiks from the party involved in just grabbing resources for, uh, you know, the pennies of what, not even a fraction of what they were worth. And the, the and in the, it's in the midst of all that you're reporting. Uh, and, the, and when during that period do you head for Uzbekistan? So I, I, w- I went to Uzbekistan kind of at the outset of that. So I went there in 91, in 92, and all that stuff was just starting. Um, the really sophisticated kind of like looting of... Uh, the country and especially the privatization schemes, which which you can talk about later. Um, You know, that, that I got into after I came back from Central Asia, uh, like in the mid, mid nineties. Ah, so, okay. So you go there at Central Asia first. So, so what the heck drives you? You go to Uzbekistan next? Is that what? Yeah, I, I just, I was not getting a lot of work when I was probably 21, 22, and there were other freelance reporters in, in, in the country. I think a lot of people had the idea that I had that, oh, I'm going to go to the former Soviet Union and, and uh, you know, be a, a stringer. And uh, so I just picked randomly a place in the map that um, that I thought would be, you know, at least in the news, but but would be far enough away from other reporters that I wouldn't have to compete with too many people. So um Tashkent was was a city that uh, I just sort of randomly discussed. I, I think it was during a street basketball game. Somebody suggested that I go there. Uh, so I, I got in a plane. Actually, no, I, f- I took a train there uh, and set up shop in, in Tashkent and, um, and tried to string. How are you financing yourself? Uh, so I had I had before I, had, I went to Russia, I did, I worked as a waiter and did demolition in Boston um, uh, and saved up some money and went over there. And fortunately, the, this is one of the things that um, I advise actually young journalists to do all the time. Just pick a place in the, in the world where it doesn't cost a whole lot to live. Uh, and at the time, if you weren't living like a Westerner in Russia, you could live on almost nothing uh, basically anywhere. And so that money went a long way for, and and then I started to make money stringing after that. And you also start earning money playing baseball. I mean, were were you like a jock in school or something? I was, I was a, uh, I played, I played baseball in, um, through high school. I was a pretty good baseball player. Uh, and then I played basketball in college. Um, and then when I got to Russia, I, in the former Soviet Union, I, I realized that sports would be a way that I could kind of kind of get into the culture a little bit and have a little, you know, um, a little bit of a, a way to get to get into the, the experience. So they were just learning baseball like there, there was a, an effort to um, they, they built a, a park it, in uh, in Moscow at the Moscow State University that had an artificial turf. I remember it was a terrible field, but uh, but I, I played there. Um, I played for a team called Spartak uh, for a little bit, and then I, I switched to the uh, CSKA, which is the Red Army team, um, and, and that was I think in 1996 I did that. So, uh, but before that, I had actually I'd also, I'd also played in Uzbekistan uh, when I was when I was there. And you're playing professionally, or was it the Na- Uzbek national baseball team? <laughs> so yeah, I I, I did end up play- so I, I played. In Uzbekistan, they did have a national team, and I and I, I played with them for a little bit, um, and that was funny. Um, I, I've told the story before, but they actually had ground rules where we played one game. I remember on a on a pasture, so if you hit certain kinds of livestock with a ball, it was a tr- double, and if we hit others, it was a triple. It sounds like a scene out of that movie Borat. Yeah, it, I, that's yeah, it's it's similar to that actually. Yeah, and um, th- it was me and like uh, ten Cuban students. Uh, who were there? I, I forget what university they were studying at, but uh, those they could actually play. I remember that. Oh yeah, the Cubans know how to play. Then when I went back to Moscow, um, you know, I, I I was working for an American newspaper in Moscow for a little bit, and uh, I just saw that they had a park there and, and managed to work my way onto one of the teams. So, so what Uzbekistan after the year two thousands, when I have learned a little bit about it. 
was a pretty vicious dictatorship. Was it so when you were there? Yeah, that's why I wasn't there that long, actually, because um, the the first articles that I wrote, I think one of the one of the things I wrote it was was for one of the wire services, and it was just about Uzbekistan's first Independence Day. And I think I put a couple of lines in there about how there had been some controversy about President Karimov, Islam Karimov, who turned into kind of the strongman leader, which was sort of the format of a lot of the former Soviet countries. And I just said that there had been some controversy about his, uh, you know, his treatment of the opposition party. And uh, in pretty short order, I got a knock on my door from <clears throat> these people from the, um, I guess the the agency at the time was the SNB, which was the uh, so it's like the, it was like the successor agency to the KGB. Um, and they they basically said I was there on, on an improper passport and sent me out of the country. So thus endeth my my career in Uzbekistan uh, early. Uh, so what year do you get back to Moscow? Uh, 92, 93, something like that. All right. So it's still pretty early in the process. So describe what's going on and what year you're there till how how long do you stay? So I was there for I was there for another two or three years and um, then I went to Mongolia uh, for a little bit and that I played professional basketball there actually uh, in the Mongolian Basketball Association. Um, All right, so I, okay, we'll get back to Moscow. How how does that, how does that happen? So I, I had come back through Moscow, and again, I was playing another street basketball game, and I, and I played with a, a guy who, who was from Ulaanbaatar, who was a Mongolian student in uh, at Moscow State University. And he told me that the Mongolians had a, a league, the NBA, the Mo Mongolian Basketball Association, which was the only league in the world that had uh, NBA rules. They had the same distance on the three-point shot, same 24-second shot clock, and uh, I thought that was funny. And I, uh, I, I, at the time, I was working for the Moscow Times, which was an expat paper there. Um, and I turned in my papers and, and got on the Trans-Siberian Railroad uh, and moved to, moved to Ulaanbaatar to, um, to try to play basketball. My idea at the time was I was going to write a book about, uh, about playing basketball, like a first-person kind of adventure story. Um, and so that's that's what I did. Oh. I mean, every each one of these stories sounds like you know should be an episode of of a series. It it, it really do, it does. Uh, all right, so what, you're in Mongolia. Uh, what, what's your takeaway and from a political cultural point of view? And and what's another adventure for you? How's it changed you? Uh, in a couple of ways. So I got there. Um, and in order to justify my presence there uh, and uh, keep a, a visa, uh, I got a job at the Mongolian uh, state news agency, which was called Mansame. So I was basically like a translator. I, I would take a uh, news text that was written in Russian and then and translate it into English for their English language wire service. So I had this weird connection to um, to the Mongolian government and to the, the state. And I was pro uh, privy to all these things that were going on, um, you know, with politics. At the same time, I was trying to pursue this ridiculous professional sports career where I was, I was making something like $90 a month, which at the time in, in Mongolia for them was uh, decent money. I got an apartment uh, and uh Basketball, oddly enough, was a huge thing in Mongolia at the time. The, there's a long backstory about why that was, but um, Mongolia was like Indiana. Like you went to every uh, every courtyard, there was a basketball court up there, and I was playing on this team. And almost overnight, I was like a celebrity in the town. It was really funny. Everywhere, everywhere I went, people would come up and um, and talk to me. My my best friend in the team was this guy who was kind of known as the Michael Jordan of, uh, of Mongolia. And so everywhere we went, girls were all over him. It was, it was hilarious. The whole thing was, was very funny. How tall are you? I'm six two. Uh, so there, let's just say there wasn't a lot of height in the league. There were a couple of guys who, who were, uh, you know, upwards of six ten, six eleven. They had a couple of real basketball players there. Um, but it was it was kind of more like Division Two level, I would say, uh, compared to the United States. It, was, well, it wasn't nice. bad. 
Yeah, that not not so bad. Yeah. 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 All right. So you, when you go back to Moscow, when? Uh, so I oh the, the other thing is that I got deathly ill while I was in Mongolia. I got pneumonia and um, had kind of a near death experience. I I had to be airlifted back to the states. I had a, an operation and um, and so I was very ill. Uh, and when I finally got well again, I went back. I went back to Moscow instead of to to Mongolia, and um, decided to stop doing. Why would you go back? I, you know, I was a young kid and I had a sort of a thirst for adventure. I didn't like the idea of staying at home and trying to work my way up through, um, you know, the ladder. I just had, I had no interest in that whatsoever. I just thought my philosophy at the time was you, you're only young once. You're going to regret it if you don't try to do as many crazy things as you can when you're, when you're a kid. Um, and so, you know, I was very attracted to being overseas and trying to travel and see the world and all that stuff. So um, I went back there. And then also I was I was really trying to, like, find my footing as a writer. And I just thought that there would be more interesting things that would be going on there. You organized this campaign for Jesse Jackson when you're in high school, uh, which puts you in a pretty left. The side of the political spectrum. Uh, are you still at by at this point? So I think my politics haven't really changed a whole lot. Uh, what's what's happened? I think is that a lot of things have changed. Um, my feeling is that a lot of things have changed around me. Like I, I still kind of believe in the same things uh, that I did in the 80s and 90s. Uh, I just think that there's been some radical shifts in America about certain issues, especially about civil liberties, um, you know, sort of free speech, uh, academic in inquiry, things like that. And um, so I was, you know, I, 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 for instance, I like Bernie Sanders very much. Uh, he was somebody that, whose career I followed uh, pretty closely. I, I spent a lot of time with him doing a bunch of stories in the 2000s and, um, so I was an admirer of his, but, uh, you know, sort of in, in modern American social media in, in this landscape, uh, some of the things that um, positions I've taken against, for instance, um, Internet censorship, you know, people will say that's a conservative position. I, I don't agree, but um, but, you know, the, the framing is different these days. Yeah, we'll, we'll get more into that. Uh, but l let's keep the history going for a bit and then we'll get more into this because I, I assume this kind of informs why you're doing that. Uh, so, so you get back to Moscow and, and you do what? And now, now you're in Moscow and this looting and free-for-all grabbing of the uh, natural resources of what had been the Soviet Union is really on full speed. Yeah. And this time around, when I came back, I didn't work for somebody else. I had this idea. Some, a friend of mine who I had met in Moscow, this Dutch guy, uh, had this idea of starting his own newspaper in Moscow. It was basically going to be a club guide, kind of like New York or Time Out. Um, and he hired me to be the editor of the text portion. Like there, there was going to be a a small part at the beginning of the newspaper that was going to have some news and information. So I ended up being the editor of that. It was a new newspaper. Um, it was called Living Here originally, and then that collapsed immediately. And I ended up joining up with this other paper that was uh, the same thing, but had, had like a humor element. So I was, I was um, writing this massive quantity of stuff every week uh, self-publishing a newspaper. And I had to learn all about Russian politics. Um, at the time, I, I wasn't, I didn't know a whole lot, but there was all this stuff going on with privatization uh, and corruption. And I, I had to learn all this stuff from scratch uh, because I hadn't covered it before. Um, so yeah, I spent like four or five years basically writing about everything that was going on in Moscow for this, for this uh, club guide type newspaper. And is that is that the one that got, you know, that was pretty funny and pretty, uh, what's the, got rather rather dark sometimes in its humor, I guess. Uh, yes, we, we, it, it was called the Exile, and um, obviously I've had some some issues with that because people have gone back through it, and they've it was it was very tasteless. I, I, I modeled it 
my co-editor uh, at the time was this guy, Mark Ames, and we modeled it very much after um, Spy Magazine, which was a thing that had been done in New York. There was a, it was sort of a very black humor, satirical uh, thing that was very prank heavy. We did all kinds of practical jokes. Uh, I remember early on, one of our first things that, that kind of got us in the map was um, I pretended to be a representative of the New York Jets, and I offered Mikhail Gorbachev a job as an assistant um, reconstruction coordinator. The team was going through a rebuilding at the time, and the, the word for rebuilding in Russian is perestroika. Uh, so we we offered him a ton of money. We made up New York Jets logos and uh, sent it to the Gorbachev Institute, and they, they were interested because they wanted the money. Uh, so we published all of that stuff, um, the correspondence between us and Gorbachev. And we we just we did a lot of stuff like that. Like, you know, when JFK Jr. died, we asked the people who took care of of Lenin's body if they would be interested in uh, helping us embalm some of the body. Part, you know? and, and they would. So they would, we got a lot of sort of traction of jokes like that. But some of them were in quite poor taste and uh, didn't age terribly well. Yeah, I think there was one about the coming death of the Pope that didn't go over so well. Uh, uh, yeah, that that was something. I, yeah, yeah, that wasn't so good either. <laughs> you know, what we were doing, what we ended up doing a lot of at that newspaper um, was sort of picking on uh, the Western coverage of of Russia, which was dictated a lot by American foreign policy, and they they would come up with these stories that the Yeltsin. Uh, regime was full of these what they call energetic young reformers. And so they, they were constantly sending home these stories about how much progress the sort of neo-capitalist version of Russia was making. And they were they were just lying. And some of it was lying and some of it was ignorance because a lot of the reporters didn't speak Russian. They never left never, never left Moscow. So we made we made fun of a lot of the sort of woodenness and stupidity of the uh, the American presence there. And we tried to be because Americans were trying to export uh, the American way everywhere. And when the expats came to Moscow, they were they were very much the typical ugly Americans. And the exile was designed to be kind of an anti uh, sort of uh, like an, almost like an anti newsletter. Right. It was like a, a, a spoof of American culture um, that Russians really connected with. And that the expats, a lot of who, who live there, uh, secretly enjoyed uh, mm. quite a lot. Thanks for joining us, Matt. All right. Thanks a lot, Paul. I really appreciate it. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. Please don't forget the donate button. And please join us for part two of Reality Asserts Itself with Matt Taibbi.